Hey everybody, just as a quick aside here, I am recording this on a bad microphone in a new location from previous videos, so if the mic quality doesn't sound as hot as normal, that is why. So, Dark Deity just dropped on Steam out of nowhere, and now it's here and everyone can play the game. You know, that's what happens when games are released. And, well, this specific game is a strategy RPG developed by Sword and Axe LLC and inspired by the Fire Emblem franchise. It's gotten a decent amount of buzz in the Fire Emblem community, and here's a couple of disclaimers I want to throw out up front. I was provided a review copy for free from Dark Deity's publisher, Freedom Games. As well, I will not be making any comparisons in this video between Dark Deity and Fire Emblem, except to say that the game was inspired by Fire Emblem, and that if you're a fan of that series, you will find yourself right at home in most of Dark Deity's gameplay. Beyond that, though, the game should be granted the space to stand on its own. I know what it's like to have your entire identity tied to Fire Emblem. Anyway, I'm not salty, and let's take a look at whether Dark Deity is worth playing. Because I haven't completed the game fully, I don't want to dive into the story except to say that if you're a sucker for teenage anime protagonist that rises up to stop evil and learn friendship, you'll enjoy the game and the story enough, but there isn't much more to it than that, at least up to the point where I am in the game. The focus instead of this video will be on the gameplay, which for many people is the real draw here. Dark Deity is about as grid-based and turn-based as it gets, and its core systems function very well. If you like turn-based strategy with characters that you get to grow and build, the large strokes of Dark Deity will be fun and satisfying. Turn-based combat can only be so fun on its own, so it's all about the fresh mix that Dark Deity brings. One of the big overhauls Dark Deity brings to the SRPG formula is that there is almost no item management, at least for combat. All playable characters carry four weapons with unlimited uses that can't be changed out. While this technically limits customization and strategy, it also focuses the experience and gives maps and base preparations a snappier flow. In my time with the game, I was always in the action. I'm fighting bad guys and leveling my dudes up. I didn't have to spend hours nursing inventories for marginal benefit. I was also never tempted to hoard in combat. I'm not a hoarder in games generally, but many people are, and Dark Deity decking each character out in four infinite weapons means that players are always going to use the right tool for the job, rather than trying to metagame what they may or may not need in the future. Without going into the jargon, there are four different weapon types in the game that give various benefits and drawbacks to a character's accuracy, damage, dodge, and critical hit chance. While metas will undoubtedly form as the game gets cracked more and more and show that certain weapon types are just plain better than others, it's still a fun system that lets the player make second-to-second -second decisions. It gives the player a more interesting and consistent drip of strategic decisions than traditional item management does. Not to say that the game doesn't have strategic item usage. There are stat boosters to be given out as well as upgrades in the form of tokens. Each character's weapons can be buffed by using a weapon token on them. Since each individual character has four individual weapons that are upgraded separately, the player has to be careful in considering which character and which weapons they want to upgrade, as upgrade tokens are limited enough to where you can't come close to upgrading everything on everyone, but plentiful enough to where the player can still experiment and play around with many different characters. And when it comes to experimenting, the game's promotion system is stuffed full of it. When a character hits level 10, they will get a chance to evolve, as it were, into a new class with all new skills. This choice does not lock the character into a class line, as all Tier 3 classes will be available to each character, no matter what Tier 2 class they chose. To be clear, each character's choices are limited into four Tier 2 classes and four Tier 3 classes based on their original class. So, in all, each character has a total of 16 different class builds that compound further with how the player chooses to upgrade weapons. You know, there's, there's a lot of possibilities here. The good part of this system is that while there are a lot of options, almost none of these options are shown to the player ahead of time. The player is instead making a series of choices that grow over the whole game. As a brief aside, by the way, I've heard the argument made that strategy games should give the player all potential information up front, otherwise it's not actually strategy. This reminds me of Sun Tzu's famous quote from The Art of War, Just reset, bro. It's in the chapter about arrow dancing. Anyway. 
Speaking about resetting, many people have asked me, Bobs, does this game have permadeath? And no, it does not. Unlike many tactics games, characters who are defeated in battle come back in the next level. However, they suffer a permanent stat penalty, losing 10% of a stat that corresponds to the weapon type that killed them. Here's the mage Arlen getting his arm broken and suffering minus one strength permanently. I don't know how they're being calculated, but it's whatever it is, it seems dishonest. Goodbye. Broken arm, strength reduced by one. Literally doesn't oh matter. Oh god. <laughs> he broke his arm. Oh my god. <laughs> Poor guy. Uh. This injury system is great because it spreads the failure spectrum wider so that a misplay or an unlikely dice roll doesn't feel like a severe punishment, but rather a temporary setback that can be recovered from. The system means that gaming the save file and resetting the game has smaller benefits than in other tactics games, which means that playing through mistakes will be easier to stomach for many players. It also creates a strong potential for interesting situations. In Chapter 4, I lost almost half my army to the initial onslaught of enemies, but because my army wasn't truly gone, I was able to push through while not being overly punished for minor mistakes or bad luck. Speaking of Chapter 4, the objective is to kill the boss and rescue the prisoners. Before the map starts, the game says that the faster you beat levels, the more money you get. It's an incentive to make players fast and aggressive, which is a playstyle that I think benefits tactics games and makes them more exciting, but this reward system is inorganic. The correlation between final turn count and money is loose at best, which is strange because the game has better incentives to push the player. Some enemies have droppable items. The bosses in chapters 2 and 3 have stat boosters the player can get, but the player must use aggression to get them. It feels cheap to tie unrelated rewards to turn count. Which, to be fair, is part of Dark Deity's MO. The game frequently uses suggestion to get players to do things they don't need to do. Chapter 2 tells you to defend the town inn. When I saw that, I tried to protect the entrance while trying hard to push a force towards the boss to see if I could kill him before the turn count is up. In reality, there was no trigger point to defend, so on repeat playthroughs, I just sent my whole army at the boss and faced no consequences for not defending the inn. Same in Chapter 3, where the goal is to route as many enemies as you can before they regroup. When I saw this objective, I thought it was awesome and there would be more consequences for not routing as many enemies as possible. Maybe Chapter 4 would be tougher, or reinforcements would be worse. But no, there is nothing to the map other than surviving, and there are no long-term consequences for sitting in a corner and not doing the map objective. One thing though that I do want to celebrate about the game is the difficulty options. I've played some of the game on Deity Mode and Mortal Mode. This is Hard and Easy Mode respectively. If you see a stream chat on the screen, that's Hard Mode, and no chat on the screen indicates Easy Mode. Deity mode is plenty challenging, but it never feels unfair. If you're the type of person who craves unfair difficulties, the game lets you do that self-inflicted crime. At the bottom of the difficulty selection screen is an option to customize the difficulty. You can randomize the game, change growth rates on character stats and on enemy stats. You can make the game as easy or as difficult as you want. It's a great feature and it vindicates my view that the Fire Emblem series should include these kinds of tools in game. People have told me these features aren't possible, but, you know, Dark Deity, and I feel so seen right now. Thank God for indie developers. One other part of the game, though, that can be an issue is the game's advantage system. Instead of having a rock, paper, scissors style approach to weapons, weapons are instead effective against an opponent's armor type. Based off of effectiveness and a bunch of different other things, Player characters and enemy units will get different percentage bonuses and debuffs to the damage that they deal towards the enemies based on the armor type. This is a cool system, but the problem is that it's percentage based rather than raw number based, so it takes the very readable and low stats of Dark Deity that make it easy to do calculations and makes them just a little bit more difficult and harder to discern as you start having to add 30%, take away 10%, adding 5% here, doing all of that to try to adjust and to understand what's going to be coming for you, and it makes it a little more difficult to set up for enemy phases than it otherwise probably should be, and it's an unfortunate part of the game that is just a little too unreadable at first compared to the rest of the numbers which are generally in more readable, easy arithmetic ranges. This game is, I would say, pretty fun and pretty good, but unfortunately though, 
all good things must come to an end, and the game suffers a death by a thousand cuts in its polish. Earlier, I said that Dark Deity brings some fresh mix to the genre, but sometimes it feels like the mix they brought was like the salad from the bento box place and my local maw that just stuffs some Hidden Valley Spring mix in the container and calls it a salad. There's just a horde of small issues that are inoffensive on their own, but cumulatively give the game a very SRPG at home feel. Lots of little things nibble at the edges of the experience. Poor transitions between battle animations and the map, music that abruptly drops in volume when it loops, not being able to check descriptions of enemy items, a selection box that doesn't adjust to the edges of the screen, among other things. But I want to stop the list there because I don't want this to be an aimless dogpile. Rather, these examples point towards a game that is finished but not well fitted. Fortunately, the game runs incredibly well. I have never encountered any slowdown or issues with how the game runs. Even fun little flourishes like the exploding HP bars do nothing to chug the frame rate. My computer is good about a baseline gaming PC, certainly not a beast. Here's how it runs Sexy Mushroom Simulator Resident Evil Village. Okay, it's every time Miranda shows up, the frame rate tanks. Is that just part of her, like, character? Is it, like, one of her superpowers? Look at that chug. If you are worried about how the game will run, I'll post my computer specs in the description below for you to compare yours with. Many of these polish issues could change as the game gets patched. It already has been patched once at the time of recording, but it could be worth waiting until more patches are rolled out if these types of issues bother you. Dark Deity is a complete game and a fun game that unfortunately probably needed an extra month or so to be ironed out. So play it if you want. I thought it was fun. If you don't want to play it, then don't. That's fine too. Do what you want with your time. But uh, anyway, there's uh, my ride, so uh, I gotta go. Bye! But shout outs to all of my patrons who make these videos possible. Consider subscribing to the Patreon in the link below. But quick shout outs to Dector A. Estjuice, Exod, Jacobra, Pengus Khan, Sabrina Seibel, Starry, Swordlocked, That Icarus Kid, Two Clutch, Vivian Alor, Yokai, Zoop Lord, Anime Gogago, Ascended Bagels, Belk Narum, BMO McGrim, Boots 42, Brian E. Martin, Enigmatic, Mr. L, Henny G, Kinsey, L. Brown, Nin, Uther 007, Will Brock, Zetetic, Zachary Nelson, A. L. Mandite, Bessipedal, Cristobal Herraro Iglesias, E. Dub, Forrest McFarland, Gilgamest Up, Gob, Hayden Quigley Herrick, Logjam, Melissa G, Michael Cruz, Mozu Pog, Nathaniel Peters, Puzzles B, Shingshin, Quoros, Ruin, Sylvester, Stephanie Roman, Tarek, Tectonic Improv, William Clemens, Willem, Anita Jakinda, Anton Nielsen, Artur Solomonik, Dabney, Danielle Kalaskis, Eltsin, Faye Nettius, Gawain, G. Merck, Jacob Rainish, Jameson, Jesse Berge, Lil Beats, Lucas DM, Liar Fan, Moderation Dev, Naomi Isabel, Noah Federson, Noe Is, A Crime, Number Wang, Rabid Pixie, Reflectga, Sam Rosenberg, Soren Lowell, Shup, Thomas G. Grow, T. Kloss 45, Tough Emily, Whooperfloss, and Zachary Parrish. Thank you all so much for your support.